Well, hello everyone, and welcome back to Adrian's Digital Basement. It's been a while since I've done any kind of Macintosh repair-a-thon, and I thought maybe it's time to do one right now. So on the bench, we have three classic Macintoshes, and by classic, I mean the form factor, which goes all the way back to the original Macintosh, or also known as the Macintosh 128. We have a Macintosh SE, a Macintosh Classic, and a Mac Macintosh Classic 2. The state of these machines, well, I have no idea about any of them. They were given to me. They were about to be recycled, so they were saved from recycling. Hopefully in this video, or potentially in multiple videos, I can see what's wrong with these things. We can get them fixed up and get them working again. So without further ado, let's get right to it. Now, when we look at these three machines and we think about the reliability of the com computer, how likely are these to actually work, even in this rough state? The Macintosh SE is definitely one of the most reliable of the classic Macintoshes. I'd say the Macintosh 128, 512, and Plus are also similarly reliable, but the benefit of the SE over those other machines is that it has internal SCSI and external SCSI. The Macintosh Plus has only external SCSI, and those other two machines don't really support hard drives at all. So if you get one of these Macintosh SEs, they're relatively inexpensive, and that's compared to the Macintosh SE30, which is probably one of the more expensive of these types of Macintoshes. And the Mac SE is just a good, honest machine. 8 megahertz, 68,000. The motherboard doesn't have leaky caps on it, so it's almost certainly gonna be perfect unless the battery has destroyed itself. And the power supply on this thing is a very high quality Sony unit that generally works all the time too. There are just some minor issues that come up with these machines and they're generally relatively easy to fix. Now the Macintosh Classic, which we could call the successor to the SE, was a low cost version of the SE. Same performance, eight megahertz, 68,000, has an internal SCSI hard drive, has external SCSI capability as well. It's pretty much feature comparable to the SE. The one main advantage of this over the SE is that not all SEs have 1.44 megabyte floppy drive support. A lot of them like this one, well, at least on the outside, it looks like it only sports 800K disks and those can be harder to make. So if you're looking for a machine where you wanna make some boot disks, well, it's harder with the Mac SE and all the earlier machines. But the Mac Classic and everything else like later than the SE can read 1.44 megabyte disks, which means you can take a regular PC or a Mac or any modern computer and get a USB floppy drive and actually just make uh, a disk image that can boot this machine. So that, that's kind of nice. But there are lots of negatives to this machine over the SE. The motherboard that's in here is filled with capacitors that can leak really badly. And that can cause massive damage to the board, uh, worst case. But best case is you still have to recap them before you can even get a working system. And recapping surface mount caps is not everyone's cup of tea. So if you want to avoid that or you don't have someone that you can trust to do it for you, then you might want to avoid classics. Don't be under any illusion that any classic that's out there at this time in 2024 that has not been recapped doesn't need to be recapped on the motherboard. They all do. 100% of them do need a recap. The other problem is the power supply board, which sits over here on these Macintoshes on the left side. Well, these machines came out, I don't know, 90, 91, something like that. And unfortunately, the 90s are when capacitors just in general started to suck. This computer's from the 80s. This thing from the 90s means that often the caps that are on the power supply also leak. Now I've found plenty of them that didn't leak and they work fine, but I've had lots of these where they did leak and that causes an issue. Moving on to the Classic 2, it's basically the same exact problems as the regular Classic. The main difference between this machine, besides the fact that it's got this really kind of a ugly glare filter on it, uh, the, the only main difference between this and the classic is that this is faster. This has a 68030 processor. I think it runs at 16 megahertz. That's the same speed as the SE30. Unlike the SE30, which is a very desirable Macintosh, this one is not really expandable. The SE30 has a processor direct slot, so there were a bunch of add-ons for it, like Ethernet cards and accelerators and video cards and stuff like that. None of them exist for this thing. This has a similar problem with the power supply, though, so that kind of is a cheap cost-reduced thing and they can go bad and leak. And of course, the motherboard is the same form factor and it can totally, well, it will have leaky caps on it. 
Generally, everything about these machines is fully interchangeable. You can put a Classic 2 motherboard into a Classic and vice versa. The Classic 2, I think, has audio input, not just audio output. And because of that, if you put it in here, you have to remove, I think you have to remove a jack, like you have to desolder the input jack. I don't think there's a, a hole on the back of the case for that. But otherwise, they are interchangeable. Once you get them up and running, and like say you've recapped the output part of the power supply and you've recapped the motherboards and cleaned up all the corrosion and stuff, then generally they're good, honest machines and they're very reliable as well. It's just out of the box. The SE is almost certainly gonna work perfectly. <laughs> well, there's 0% chance that these are gonna work. So that's my spiel on these classic Macintoshes. I think what I'm gonna do is put them on the floor and we're gonna focus on the Mac SE for this episode. So first things first, I have it on the turntable here. Let's take a look at it. So as I mentioned before, this is the version that does not have the high density disk drive, at least the, it originally wasn't, it could have been upgraded. It would say HDFD on the bottom here, FD for floppy drive, HD for high density. So this one doesn't appear to have that. It's in really, really dirty shape, but it doesn't look like it's completely too far gone. So a little cleaning, a little TLC, should go a long way to make this thing look pretty good. I don't immediately see any kind of burning on the screen, so that's good. If we look at the side here, uh, we can see that the machine is not really together for whatever reason. The side looks fine. This other side looks fine as well. And on the back, we can see the specs about this machine. All right, so you can always tell quite a bit from, well, at least how the machine was originally specced. So this was only a one megabyte machine with a single 800K drive and a 20 megabyte hard drive. You did have Mac SEs that were sold with four megs. You had Mac SEs that were sold with dual internal disk drives. So it would say 800K or two 800K and no internal hard drive. The Mac SE actually has expandability as well. And that is compared to the Mac Classic, which did not. And I don't think a lot of people did it or used it, but this is the breakout or the blank that you can remove from the back of the case. There were internal accelerators and things like that. And there were also video cards to drive an external monitor. And what you do is you pop out this blank and there's a mounting bracket behind it. And that's where you could connect things up. There were also ethernet cards and I'm sure disk drive adapters, I don't know, all sorts of other stuff. So there was some expandability and it's pretty cool that Apple decided to add that considering all the Macintoshes prior to that did not have any such expandability. The port layout on the Mac SE is exactly the same as it is on the Macintosh Plus. So you have two ADB ports, floppy drive port, SCSI port, printer, modem, or Apple Talk as well as one of these. And you have a headphone jack or audio output. Another nicety over the older Macs is that the switching power supply that's in here is built by Sony. I think it typically is, or maybe Aztec. I think there were a couple manufacturers and I think it's multi-voltage, which means you can use a North American one in well, overseas markets and it does work. It says here that the voltage range is 100 to 240 volts. Kind of cool. Unlike the Macs before the Mac SE, Apple also added a fan and the early versions of the fan was sort of like a cage fan. So it looked like a hamster wheel and it was very noisy. And a mod to do, well, a mod that Apple did and also third parties could do is you would swap that out with a regular fan that would just make the machine a whole lot quieter. But that's a nice addition because the original Macs had no fan and they used convection cooling entirely and they had vents along the top of the machine and they would get pretty hot. And I think it would kind of bake the machines it probably was fine because there's a lot of Macintoshes out there, Mac Pluses and stuff that work perfectly today. But I think people were uneasy with the amount of heat that came out of the machine. So Apple added this. And I think it was a necessity in a way because the hard drive that was added into this thing definitely, you know, added more load and created a lot of heat on its own because old hard drives just did. So the fan was a good necessity and it kept these things running cooler. Anyhow, all the screws are removed already from this. There are two here and then there are two under the handle. You do need an unreasonably long screwdriver to get the two on the top out. So let's get the back cover off so we can see what this looks like on the inside. All right, so right off the bat, there's this shield here and this is normal for all Macintoshes. You definitely wanna keep this. It says plastic here. There is RF shielding going on, but it's mainly the fact that this plastic here keeps the bottom of the motherboard from touching the bottom of the case. And if we look inside the case, you can see that it's sort of a shiny metallic color, and that's because it's metallized, or the coating on here is metallized, and it's probably conductive. So if the motherboard kind of bends and touches this at all, or you bend up on the bottom of the case, then it could, could cause a short. Looking inside this machine, it's not looking too bad. 
Right off the bat, the CRT neck board is off. Now, that's not necessarily a bad thing. That's actually a good thing because someone has already removed the SCSI hard drive from this machine. Now, when you're doing that, if this is attached, it's very easy to bump this and accidentally break the CRT. You will neck the CRT and let air into it, which renders it useless and you will need to replace it. So the little neck board here, I'll just reattach it just to demonstrate. So while it's attached right there, all you have to do to get it off is just gently pull it and you rock it off like that. And then you can kind of tuck it out of the way. And that just ensures that you don't accidentally break the back of the CRT here. Let's just talk quickly about safety. Obviously on the inside of this machine, we have a CRT, 12,000 volts. We have a power supply here, mains voltage. The real danger is the power supply here. If you have a plugged in, turned on, we're talking stuff that can be possibly lethal if you do the wrong thing. The 12,000 volts on the CRT would just give you a really bad shock. This particular computer has been turned off for months and months and months. So there is no charge in here at all. So if you're unsure, unplug your computer, set it aside for a month, <laughs> then you can go work on it and feel a little safer about not getting shock. Now, if all you need to do is, for instance, get to the motherboard, which is on the bottom of this thing, you can generally ignore these scary areas, just pull the neck board off like I did here, tuck that out of the way, and then we have to get the motherboard out of here. So what you have to do is, uh, someone's already unscrewed this bracket for the hard drive, so we're just gonna pull that out. How nice, they even left the screws in there. Very nice of them. What we need to do is we need to unplug this connector that goes down from the power supply down to the motherboard because we want to take a look at how the motherboard looks. So you got to kind of reach down and there is a clip on there and you just rock it side to side while you're pushing on that clip right there and then that pulls off. And that's why you want to take this neck board off because if it was in position, you could very easily pull up and bump it and then that would, that would be the end of your CRT. So besides the power cable that uh, goes to the motherboard, and there was one here for the hard drive, there is a floppy drive ribbon cable as well. So you just pull that out. And with the computer on its face, you might wanna use a blanket or something so you don't potentially scratch it. You have to pull up on the motherboard just a little bit and there are some notches over here. And once you pull it up enough, it lines up with these notches and you just angle the motherboard out. And there is one connector here. I'm sorry, I'm not showing it, but it is the speaker connector there. And there it is. There is the motherboard. The Macintosh SE motherboard, a nice, honest, good Macintosh. Well-built and reliable. There's the processor direct slot. Here are four SIM slots that can accommodate up to four megabytes of RAM. They can break because the clips here are super fragile, so just be careful of that. We have an eight megahertz 68,000, and we do have a lithium battery, which I am going to cut out of here Toot Sweet or Pronto or whatever you want to call it, because that battery, while this one hasn't leaked, it is made by our friends at Varda. It's not a rechargeable battery. So it's a lithium battery. It's not lithium ion and it's not NICAD. NICADs are the ones that leak and destroy a lot of motherboards, Amigas and stuff like that. These can leak and they're very destructive when they do, but it's much less likely that they do leak. Just for fun, let's take a look and see what kind of charge we have here. Uh, what? What? 2.9 volts? That's unbelievable. This it freaking has a charge. Wow. Nonetheless, I don't know when it's from. So that goes into my bad battery thing here. Now, when it comes to batteries on these older Macintoshes, they can run fine without a battery. They really have no issues whatsoever. The battery is used for storing the time, the date, and also the startup disk. Look at these like pieces of dust in here. It's really kind of funny. So the startup disk is if you have multiple hard drives on your Macintosh, like say you have an internal hard drive and you have two external hard drives and you wanna select which one you wanna boot from when you power the machine on, that particular setting is stored in the non-volatile RAM. So without a battery, that will get lost every time you reboot the machine. But if you only have one internal hard drive and you don't care about the time and date, because I mean, who's using these things for productive work where you need an accurate time, then you might just wanna cut the battery out and leave it out. But please keep in mind that it's a bit of a lottery if the battery has or has not leaked. Now I've had SEs where the battery has leaked and it destroys the motherboard and a lot of the case as well. And it's not something that's easily fixable. There are some videos out there, people tried to repair the boards, but it's, it's a nightmare. So if you're looking to buy one of these things and there aren't pictures of the inside, be very wary. 
ask for a high resolution and clear picture of the back of the case where the ports are and the screws. There's one here and one here, and also maybe the bottom of the case because the battery leakage often causes a bunch of corrosion and rust on the ports and it can leak into the bottom as well. So it's often evident from the outside, but not always. So it is quite possible that you have a really pristine looking machine that has severe destruction on the inside. But then from a capacitor standpoint, all we have is these axial caps here and they're really good quality. This thing was made in the eighties and they don't generally leak. The day codes on some of these chips, 1988 21st week, 1988 31st week, 1988 33rd week. So you kind of get the picture that this thing is from the eighties. And uh, that means that the parts on here are just really good quality. Things dusty, but overall in really, really good shape. Now, with regards to the battery, it is just a lithium battery. It means it does not charge. So you can actually just install a CR2032 holder and you can say, stick it onto one of these chips over here. Just put wires there to those pins. It's a really simple job actually. And those CR2032s last quite a while in here. And the good thing is they're very, very, very unlikely to leak. I'm, I've heard they can leak, but as much looking as I've done, I've never found a picture with any kind of leakage from a 2032 that caused actual destruction. I've seen pictures of some that have kind of bulged and had a little bit of crust around them, but nothing like the cylinder battery that was in this machine, which can totally destroy things. So I'm gonna say that there's really nothing more to do for this particular board. There's a good chance that this just works perfectly. And the only upgrade I might wanna do is replace this crappy one meg RAM here with one meg SIM. So we get a total of four megabytes. And yeah, I mean, this thing should work. So let's turn our attention over to the chassis. And let's see how that thing looks. Okay, so looking at the chassis here, we can see right away that we are dealing with the Sony version of the power supply. I've never had any issues with reefas or anything inside of these or leaky caps. I do know people who have had to recap them or said they needed to be recapped, but I've had lots of SEs come through the basement and I have never had a single issue with these power supplies. So your mileage may vary, but that's just my experience. You can see the date code though here, ninth week of 1988. Now, right here is the floppy drive for the computer. It's a little bit of dust there. There is a single screw on the bottom side that, that pops out and then you can slide this whole thing out. I have some videos on my channel, which I'll link to down below about how to service these disk drives. There are other people who also show you how to service them. They're pretty reliable. The biggest issue with them is the automated ejecta mechanism causes them to get a bit gummed up. So there's a bunch of lubrication in them that starts to become solid and it just doesn't really work that well when you stick a disk in there. And then on top of that, there's a plastic eject gear that also generally degrades and falls apart. So then they won't eject anymore. And that means you have to use a paper clip to get the floppy disk out of there. Luckily, there are sellers on eBay now that sell those eject gears pretty cheaply. They're resin printed, I think, and they work quite well. I've used them plenty of times. In fact, I think I'm all out of them and I need to order another set but they're inexpensive and it's a quick, reliable fix for these disk drives. So the general gist is if the drive is not working because it's all gummed up, you're just gonna have to remove it from the computer and clean up all that grease that's in there and potentially fix that gear. In fact, I'm gonna say that 100% of these machines are gonna need a new gear. If it's working now, it's just gonna fail very soon. Now this particular computer seems to be in pretty nice shape. And let's take this uh, scrap disk here and pop it in here. Uh, it kind of went in with a clunk, but not as much of a clunk as I would like. So I'm gonna say that this drive definitely is gonna need the old cleaning of the grease and all that stuff. And I'm not gonna cover that on this video because uh, there's another video about that anyways. And the thing is the Mac SE and all these classic Macs can work fine without a disk drive. You can even have it unplugged and the machine will work perfectly. And in fact, you can plug a floppy drive into the outside or external port on the back of the machine and it will work as well. So if you have something like a floppy emu, it's an emulator for floppy drives for Macintosh, that will work perfectly and you could just use that. Or the other thing is you could just use a SCSI disk emulator and skip the floppy drive stuff altogether because writing these 800K floppy disks is a bit of a pain on these machines and you need special stuff to even do that. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna use this paper clip here to try to extricate this disk. There we go. Oh dear. So what just happened is it actually, the disc is sort of half out of the drive. It ejected and then it tried to take it back in while the drive wasn't fully out. The disc wasn't out, I mean, so there it is. You just have to kind of re-push the paperclip in the hole. So there's one other issue that does crop up on these machines and also Macintosh Pluses. And I made a video about a Mac Plus repair in the past where the only thing that was wrong with it is what I'm about to say is probably 
going to need fixing on this machine. What happens on the analog board, which is the part here that does the driving of the CRT, is you get bad solder joints and bad connections on things like the deflection yoke, which is this part right here, and that's this rainbow cable that goes onto the board. That can often have issues, and you can also have issues on this main cable here that comes from the motherboard and goes up to the board. So you get crack solder joints there as well. So reflowing those can generally fix most issues with Macintosh SEs. Now, when I was growing up, we actually had a Macintosh SE and it was like the family computer. And that thing, I still have that exact machine. It's the only retro computer that I still have. And that had these exact issues. I'd be using the machine and like the image would kind of get wavy and get squishy and move around. And, and if you like jiggled cables inside, you know, it would change and stuff. And I think the deflection yoke connection that went onto the board here was overheating because it had a really bad connection and it was sort of melting. And so I reflowed all those solder joints and that fixed all the problems. And to this day, that machine now works perfectly again. No issues whatsoever. I've not replaced a single component there. Well, other than the hard drive, which did die. Because <laughs> those original 20 meg hard drives, like the one that was in this machine at 20 SC, super unreliable drives. But other than that, all the other components are original and totally work. So that's actually the one thing I'm going to actually do to this machine other than just plug everything back in and turn it on. And what we need to do is we have to gain access to the backside of this plastic cover right here. Now, what Apple did is they used these little, I don't know, push-in things here to hold this thing down. So you can't just lift this up very easily. On older Macintoshes, they actually use like double-sided tape and you just peel it up. But on the Mac SE, it's nice because they use these black things here and you can pop them out. Now, the issue is with these, and here's one right here, is to pop it out, you have to push a tool into it on this side. That's fine for this one, but there are some that are like way in here and they're just not really reachable, not without removing this entire board. So I'm gonna use this little pick tool here and I'm gonna pop this one out just to demonstrate the way they work. So you push like that and you see there it kind of pushed out and then you can just pull the whole thing out. Now it looks like there's another one right here which you can actually get to from this side as well. I know you can't really see it, but there it is. And actually the one that's down here, you can also get to. And the reason why I'm doing it this way is I'm just trying to show that you don't really have to take this board out. So that one is out there. And I think now I can actually just peel this all back. Yeah, we can actually access all the solder joints so we can do the work here without actually having to remove this entire thing. Now removing it is not that hard. There's a couple screws right here and then it just pops out, but you're gonna need to unplug the connections from the CRT, like the high voltage anode and all that stuff. And if you're not so sure about doing that, then this is a good alternative. So looking at the board here, I'm gonna say that most of this looks like it's great, but these four wires here, that's the connection that goes to the, the deflection yoke. These often have issues. They carry a lot of current, so they get hot and they can crack. And the other issue or place that you have an issue is right here, which is the connector that goes to the motherboard. This one here is another connector. This one goes to the neck board. So it's probably worth flowing this one, this one, these four pins, and this goes to the hard drive. This is the Molex connector for the hard drive. I think that's gonna be fine. And actually this is another connector here. This is what goes to the Sony power supply, which is on the other side of this PCB right here. It's in a metal box. So probably just doing all of these connectors is probably a good idea. This right here is actually a chip. It's not a connector, so it's nothing to do there. And then right here is a flyback transformer and it's worth doing these joints as well. I'm just gonna use some vice grips attached to the plastic here to just bend it out of the way here so it's, it gives me a clear working space. Whoop, so the vice grip was just shifting there. I have my soldering iron warmed up and let's just get to work. Oh, and I can see there's a crack right there on that one. So, yep, yeah, just sort of heat it all up, reflow it, and you just go down the line. It's not harmful to do this work. In other words, it's not going to hurt anything. So it's not like you need to validate that it is cracked before you try to reflow it. I just recommend you do this reflow work uh, whenever you have one of these machines out because it only takes you a minute, and it's just going to help ensure long-term reliability. This one is being a bit more difficult because there's a giant ground plane on it. This one here has a crack on it as well. 
Now, when these have cracks, what can happen is you can just get intermittent things, intermittent low voltage or high voltage, low voltage, you know, geometry issues on the CRT. You can lose your video signal. I mean, there's just all sorts of things like that that can happen. And this just happens because over time, the solder connections warm up and they cool off and warm up and cool off and it can cause this exact cracking issue. Just make sure while you're doing this that you don't cause any kind of shorts, like you don't bridge anything. Okay, so I've done the reflowing on all the connectors. Now I'm just gonna give this a once over and just look with my eyes just to see if I see anything out of the ordinary, any kind of cracks or anything. This machine is in such good shape. I mean, it's dirty, but it has obviously low hours on it. So I really don't think there's any issues on there. So I'm just making sure that that all looks good. And um, yep, there's a little blob of solder there. I must've caused that. So I'll just clean that stuff off with my finger. I think we're all good to go on this. This looks good. Now you could also think about reflowing these solder joints right here. I have had some machines, usually on the Mac Pluses, where there are some cracks. This is the connector that goes to the analog board. You know what? It's out. Let's heat this up again. I'll just do it while we're here. I don't see any issues. These, these connections look really good. All right, that is done. And now I would say the only thing left to do is just give it a little inspection. Just look for anything that's out of the ordinary. Like you want to make sure nothing's bent and shorting itself. No traces look like they're ripped or cut. Again, this machine is in super good shape. I don't know what this line is right here. Is this like hot glue or something? I don't know, some kind of glue. It doesn't easily come off though. So I'm just gonna leave it. It doesn't look like it's gonna cause any kind of issues. Yeah, everything looks good on this. For getting the motherboard back in, you just have to connect the speaker up. I mean, you don't have to, but you can connect the speaker up like so. And then notice these notches are on this side here. Those are the ones that have to kind of slide past these things. So this is the side here that edges in to the side of the chassis, kind of like a hinge like that. And then it just sort of pops in. You can see those notches went right through there and the motherboard slides down. And we don't need to reconnect this floppy drive. We can just leave that out of the way, but I definitely need to connect up the power supply and the video cable here to the motherboard. We will need to put this neck board back on and the neck board looks like it's in really good shape. So we just sort of wiggle that on just like that. So that's in place. And believe it or not, this machine is actually ready for some testing at this point. So I'm going to do a little prep work here. I'm just gonna get this plugged into the mains. Let's make sure this is in the off position. Plug that in like so. Before I turn it on though, I'm gonna take this hard drive connector and I'm gonna connect my multimeter up because I want to just see if we're getting some good voltage rails on this thing. The one that's really important is the five volt rail. And that's because that's what drives all the digital electronics on the board here. 12 volts is used for the floppy drive and the CRT stuff. We wanna make sure five volts is good and not like at 10 volts or something because that would surely end everything on this motherboard. Now, one way to power this thing up without the motherboard is you have to put a load on the power supply. So you need to connect up some kind of load resistors to simulate having the motherboard there. And then that would kind of give you a good indication if you were getting a good solid five volts. The thing is, a lot of people aren't just gonna have a bunch of load resistors or electronic load sitting around for testing. So if you're trying to work on one of these at home, this is probably the best thing you can do. You need to get yourself a multimeter and just connect that up to the five volt rail here, which I think is the red wire. And then you turn this thing on. Here we go. 5.07 volts. That looks good. We heard the, the chime, which was the right sound. I think high voltage is running. So let's uh, get that out of here. And I'm just turning the machine around. And look at that. It's dirty, but it's working. <laughs> so reliable, so, so reliable. So it does appear that this thing, even though it doesn't look like it's been used that much because it's very clean on the inside, dirty on the outside, I think the CRT is pretty worn out. Now things do look very sharp and that's cool. So let's try tweaking on some settings and see if we can improve how things look here a little bit. 
So on the side of the machine here, we have four controls that are adjustable. You have a width coil, and you're gonna need a special tool like a plastic tool like this to do that adjustment. It's a metal slug inside of a coil, and you don't wanna stick something metal in there to turn it. This is the correct tool for that. So that's width. Height is just a normal potentiometer, so a little insulated flat blade screwdriver works there. We have sub brightness, which we can hopefully correct this dim screen with that. And we have a focus control. The width actually looks okay. So I'm not even really gonna touch that. For making adjustments on the other things, I'm gonna use this, which is a little ceramic flat blade screwdriver. I got a set of these from AliExpress for a few dollars years ago. And I like them because it's ceramic, which means it's completely non-conductive and means I can stick it in things here. And even if there's potentially some high voltages there, it keeps my hands away from it. So first let's do the brightness control. I obviously turned it down a little bit and you can see there, there is some adjustability. It's quite a lot of adjustability actually. Now the screen is maxed out right now. So that's as bright as it gets. I'm gonna turn it down from max to say there. And I'm gonna turn this up until that looks like a good amount of brightness for, you know, not fully turned up, but still more headroom is available. And that's good because it can get brighter, but of course it blooms a little bit when you turn it up more. But at a normal level like that, it's actually quite good. Now, definitely we need some more height. So I'm gonna go into the height control here and look around and there we go. Now we have some additional height. That doesn't look so bad now. And then the last control to adjust is focus. And it's actually nice to have this checkerboard dot pattern here at the boot screen because you wanna get the focus set up where it's as sharp as possible. So it's kind of fuzzy now. You won't be able to see that in the camera. Maybe if I zoom in a little bit here, you can see it a bit better, but you just wanna get it set where the middle and the edges are about as sharp as you can get. Now, unfortunately, you can get to a point where it's sharper here than it is in the middle and vice versa. So you have to sort of balance the difference a little bit. Now I can tell the CRT, I think is a little worn out. Uh, no, you know, it's not so bad actually. I was gonna say it's blooming a little bit, which means it's fuzzier than it should be, but that looks quite good. It really, it really does. So I think this computer has proved that it's reliable and it deserves a little bit of cleaning. So I'm just gonna get it with some Windex here. <laughs> just to, I mean, I could have done this, I could have done this sooner <laughs> to, to make it a little easier to do the focus adjustment, but underneath the grime <laughs> is a really good looking CRT. Yeah. <laughs> that looks awesome. That looks, that looks really great. I'll just hit the rest of this here as well while I'm at it. It is so grimy. I don't know what happened to this thing. It has a little bit of a damp, musty smell to it too. So even though it doesn't look like it has any corrosion on the inside, obviously it was stored in a, a wet and damp environment. Now this video series is not gonna be about making these computers look perfect because there are plenty of other videos out there for that type of restoration work. I just wanted to get these computers actually working and well, this Mac SC has sort of proved, oops, I just turned that up while I was cleaning there. The Mac SC has proved that as I suspected, you don't really have to do much to make these computers work. In fact, I might not have had to do anything. In fact, I might not have had to do anything. The stuff that I fixed, which was reflowing those solder joints, mainly removing the battery, might not have even been an issue with this machine. That's amazing. It just, it looks freaking great. And if we bump the computer right here, just to see if there's any kind of like cutting out or geometry changes, nothing. It looks freaking fantastic. Let's power this off. And I'm just gonna power back on in a moment here. Let it cool down for a sec. There we go. That's completely normal for Macintosh SE. We saw a line there. Then the vertical starts, a little bit of uh, garbage on the screen. It clears the memory. And then you get here to the flashing disk mark. So I am quite confident now that I don't need to do any further work on the analog board. So I'm gonna put these little plastic plugs back in. Probably recommend unplugging the power before you do that. But all you have to do is keep it, the little plug pulled out, hold it like that, push it through the hole. And then once it's in the hole, then you just push the clip in and that sort of spreads the plastic on the other side. And that holds this plastic on for good. I'm just reassembling this. And the little bag that was inside with the screws actually has the four case screws, which is excellent. So I've reinstalled the hard drive bracket. I reconnected the floppy drive. I'm just gonna take this little bag with these two extra screws, which I think were from the hard drive. And I'm just gonna tuck them in here. 
That way, whoever goes to put another hard drive in this thing in the future, if they ever do, well, they'll actually have the original screws. So a little plastic shield back on. Ooh, and I just noticed there is a little break in the case right here. I bet you when someone put the back cover on, they kind of wedged it into this corner here. And it looks like it has actually caused a little bit of damage there. It would be fixable, but it would take a bit more time than I have here for this video. So for now, I think I'm just gonna put a little piece of tape over this. The tape is mainly just to hold that little piece in place so that it doesn't break off and uh, go and get missing because it would be easy to repair in the future if you had that piece, but not if it's missing. I gave the back cover a little bit of a, just a quick and dirty clean just so it wasn't so filthy. And look at that, that just slid on there without any issue. When I got this thing, the back cover wouldn't really go on all the way. It had a gap and stuff. And I assume that was just because something was out of position inside or whatever, but now it just went right back on. For reinstalling the screws, I have my unreasonably long screwdriver here, which is good because I can get down in there for the ones in the handle. So these black screws here, these are the fine metal screws. These ones go in the back here through the motherboard ears. And the other two screws, they're silver. They go down into the two holes that are right up here. And it's good to do that thing where you go backwards with the screwdriver until you hear a click. And once you do, it's sort of seated into the old threads and then you turn it and get it into position. And unfortunately, this standoff must be broken because this just turns forever and doesn't actually tighten down. But you know what? That's actually not that big of a deal. The one screw in the top is plenty strong. You don't really need both of them up there. All right, the computer is all back together. So it's time for some testing. We already know this thing works. I did plug in a mouse and keyboard off to the side here. And for the lack of hard drive inside, I'm gonna be using this. This is the miniature version of the Blue Scuzzy version two. So it's got a Raspberry Pi Pico inside. The difference between this one and the regular one is this connects to the computer or whatever computer you're testing through a 25 pin SCSI connector. It is self powered directly from the SCSI bus. Almost all computers provide five volt termination power over the SCSI bus. The only one that doesn't I think is the Mac Plus, but every other computer I've ever used that had a 25 pin connector like this, including the Amiga, will just power something like this directly up right off the bus. On the side here, it has a micro SD card slot. So I have an SD card in there that I've already prepared. It has one of my images that I've been using for a long time for SCSI emulators. And it does have a USB connection on the side, just in case it does not power up off the bus, you can power it up off the USB. Connecting it to a Mac SE is as easy as just connecting this right to the SCSI connector. And that's it, you're done. You don't have to plug any power into this thing. It will just work right off the machine. I wanna give a shout out to Joe over at Joe's Computer Museum for setting this into the basement. I'm just turning the machine on. He sent in both the miniature version there and the full-size version. And I've used that full-size version on a couple videos already. Uh, depends on when this one comes out, if you've already seen those or not. But this is the first time I'm using the mini one in a video. I did already prepare it off camera though and tested it on another machine just to make sure that it works. I didn't wanna have that be a big failure point right now. I wanted to make sure the SCSI works on this thing and not figure out if the blue SCSI works. And there you go, it's booting up. I configured this with System 6, which is a perfect system to run on a Mac SE like this. In fact, it's my personal opinion that System 6 is the best OS to run on the Macintosh SE or really any of the eight megahertz or 7.8 megahertz Macintoshes. Later versions of the systems do work on this, but they are slow. This machine's already slow enough. You don't wanna slow it down with like a over complex system with multitasking and all sorts of stuff that just makes the computer chug. I remember back in the day when I was a kid using a Mac SE that when I had system seven on there, I used to get frustrated actually with how slow it was. And system six is slow, like just moving this window here. It's pretty sluggish, but if you drag this off here and then bring it back, watch how slowly it redraws everything. It's, it's not fast. And if we open up the control panel, Kind of chugs. Yeah, anyways, let's see if things are working here. Yeah, sound, we already know the sound works. Actually, we heard it beep when we turned it on. Let's hear some of those digitized sounds this thing supports. Monkey, boing. Yeah, there we go. I brought up SCSI probe here and there it is as configured as disc one and it says awesome blue SCSI. I edited the INI file on the blue SCSI so that it would change the vendor and product ID to something that I wanted. 
Now let's check out the system here and see how much me memory. Wow, we only have two megabytes of RAM. That is surprising. That is a supported RAM configuration for the Mac SE, but you get it by putting two one meg SIMs in there. There were four memory modules in this computer, which means that we have a problem. I guess those are one meg memory modules in there. So someone did try to update this computer or upgrade it to four megs, but one of them has a bad contact or is bad that, or one or two of them that is resulting in it only seeing half the memory. So I guess I'm gonna have to crack this open to try to fix that problem, but it's actually not all bad because I realized I forgot to put the SCSI cable back inside and I'd like to keep this in there with the hard drive bracket, which is inside the computer for when a hard drive gets installed this thing, you don't have to go looking around for a SCSI cable. So let's shut this thing down and crack it open again. With the motherboard out, absolutely, without a doubt, these are one megabyte memory modules. I just looked at these and assumed they were 256K each. So I luckily have a bunch of other one megabyte memory modules. So I'm just gonna swap all four of these out and uh, I'll just put them in the untested pile for future testing with the RAM tester. Now I mentioned earlier in the video that these slots are very fragile. So you have to be very careful getting these out. And I can see that this one's already bent over here. So this one is not really held in properly. If you put too much stress on these slots, it will break them. And then the memory modules won't be held into the, me the motherboard properly. You only want to bend the tab as far as necessary to release the memory module. So I actually kind of recommend that you use a tool like this. So you can actually see it when you're using your thumbs. You can't really look at the clips that you're pushing on. So you can't see if you're pushing them too far. So with the little tool, you can just push it the right amount. This one was also only held in with one clip. The clip's not broken on the other side here. It just was bent over to the side. And it's still bent because it's been like that for who knows how many years. But with the tool, you can kind of bend one side first like that and then do the other side. And there we go. No clips were harmed in the removal of those memory modules. Okay, well, I think I might actually see the problem here with what was going on there. Looks like the jumper was set incorrectly. There's a two slash four setting and a one megabyte setting, and it was set to the one megabyte setting. I don't exactly know what happens if you install four megs and then you have it on the wrong setting but perhaps it does that where you only see two megabytes. Either way, I don't fully test these kind of memory modules. I don't really like these. So I'm just gonna put some new ones in of the lower profile variety and we'll go from there. Now, in case you're asking or wondering why four megabytes is the maximum memory configuration on these Macs, because this 68,000 actually supports 16 megabytes of memory. For whatever reason, Apple's memory map that they picked on the original Macintosh only allocate four megabytes of RAM throughout the entire memory map. The rest of the map is used up for like IO and ROMs and other things. And unfortunately with the glue logic on the motherboard, which is in this IC on this particular one or on the older Macs, it was a bunch of discrete logic. It only can map four megabytes of memory. So you cannot install larger memory modules in here and try to get additional RAM. Four megabytes is the hard limit. And if you install four meg SIMs into here, it will ignore them and it will use them strictly as one megabyte modules. Question of getting these back in here without breaking anything. There we go, that was good. Good. You wanna make sure that the modules, oh, I just realized these are four meg modules. <laughs> I just noticed the four written on there. So that would be a waste if I accidentally left these in here. So now I gotta get these out of here and put extra stress on these very fragile connectors. All right, try number two. These are all tested and they are one megabyte modules. They are not four megabyte modules. It would be absolutely silly to leave four meg modules in here because <laughs> they won't be used, A, and it's not like they're the most common memory modules around. So that would be a big waste. This should work at four megs now. Oh, and also once I switch the jumper over to four megabytes. The machine is back together. I didn't even test it. I'm just believing in my knowledge of the way this works, that this computer should work and should have four megabytes. Okay, system is booted up. Are we gonna have four megs? Fingers are crossed. Two megs again, really? All right, I bet you there were people who were screaming at the screen who know the Macintosh better than me. I looked up this article here and it says, it's gonna be hard to read, to upgrade to four megabytes, remove the SIMs, the 256K SIMs, install one meg SIMs. If you have a resistor motherboard, set the resistors. If you have the jumper, remove the jumper. Do not set the jumper, because if you do, you get two megabytes. 
Ah, that's super unintuitive. <laughs> my knowledge, my knowledge failed me. Okay. All right, we are back and third time's a charm because we now have four megs of RAM. I did actually end up putting back two of these larger sticks in there, but I realized the reason why those little clips were bent, these are actually too tall to be put in these machines. The fact that these are regular through-hole chips means that they don't stack close enough together and two of the slots hold these fine, but when you try to stack the next one in, it actually pushes up against the other module and you can't clip it in properly. And that is exactly the way these were installed in this machine, which was improper. So I put two of these in there and then I put two of those low profile ones in there, which are much thinner and they clip in perfectly. And as we can see that little combo of RAM and removing the jumper results in the four megs of RAM. Let's, oh no, <laughs> no, no, no. Boy, oh boy, <laughs> I was about to run a game and the machine crashed. Okay, well, that pretty much tells me that the two sticks that I did put in there, which were the SK Hynix ones, are not compatible <laughs> with this machine. <laughs> so here we go a fourth time. Luckily I didn't put the screws back in this time, so <laughs> it'll be quicker to take it apart. Fourth time's a charm. Fifth time's a charm. I actually don't really remember at this point. I put four identical memory modules, totally different ones into here. I just took out all that original memory that's in here. And as you can see, we're running the Crystal Quest demo here. This is my stress test for these types of Macintoshes. Seems to be working without any issues. It's not crashing any longer. It's just seemingly working. So my assumption is, my assumption of what happened was that some of this memory was bad because even when I was swapping out the other modules, the other two, it was still crashing. It was hard to know whether it was this memory that was the problem or it was the memory I put in that was the problem, but since the RAM I put in was tested, it is my assumption that it is this memory that has an issue and maybe that's why it was set to two megabytes. Perhaps that was the problem here is this thing was crashing and they set that jumper to two megs and then that made the whole system work. I don't know. Either way, I'm not throwing this memory out. I'm just gonna put it in my two test memory bag and we'll find out at some point in the future if the problem exists here or was with one of those other sticks. All right, so this computer does seem to be working now. So I'm gonna put it back together for the hopeful final time, finally. Incidentally, there are no broken standoffs at the front here. It's just that one of these is stripped out. I don't remember which one it is now, but if you put the screw in there, it just sort of turns forever. So with a little JB weld or epoxy or whatever, that would be fixable at some point in the future. But for now, it's fine with just three screws holding the case on. And just like that, the Macintosh SE is fully reassembled and fully working with the maximum RAM configuration. The only thing left to do on this machine would be a little bit of cleaning, a little bit of RetroBrite and a service on this floppy drive, plus perhaps an internal SCSI drive. Although using this awesome mini external one is a really good solution because it's transportable to other machines so it doesn't get locked inside here and it works really, really well. As I predicted at the beginning of this episode, this machine I said was most likely to work and yeah, sure enough, it pretty much works. Other than the weird RAM thing that was going on that maybe was just the jumper and perhaps the RAM was bad, I don't know. I think this thing would have worked even without me reflowing those solder joints. That was just sort of insurance for future longevity of this machine. Well, I think before I end this episode, why don't we grab the Macintosh Classic next, put that on the bench, and let's just survey what that thing looks like on the inside. I'm convinced it's probably gonna look pretty ugly, but maybe I'm wrong and the thing will just work. <laughs> Let me grab it next. All right, just a quick look at the classic. It's yellow, it's a little beat up. It's not as dirty as the SE was at the beginning of the episode. On the left side of the machine, there's actually a built-in reset and interrupt switch. Interrupt is sort of like the non-maskable interrupt button. Hitting control, restore on the Commodore 64. It's kind of like that equivalent. This is optional on the SE. There's a little button that you stick on the side of the machine. Those always get broken and lost. It's nice, it's just built into the case here. Although one of the buttons is missing, I'm not sure which one it is. One works and the other one you can't really push. So this got hit at some point and broken. Other side of the machine, it's just yellow and a little dingy. A little, a little bit of white stuff at the top. I don't know what that is. The back of the machine, not a whole lot to report. The one difference on this, of course, is it doesn't have any expandability like on the Macintosh SE, but it does have this trapdoor here. You might think that's some kind of expansion slot, 
but it's not. If I pop that off, whoa, it went flying there. <laughs> These are controls for the analog board. So you can actually make adjustments to the CRT on the outside of the case without having to open it. So that's, that's kind of a nicety actually. It would have been nice if Apple labeled these, but they didn't. So you have to do a little bit of Google searching online. Then I think someone has a diagram that you can follow to make those adjustments, but it's gonna have very similar adjustments to what we did on the SE with a width coil, a height control. There's also a sub brightness and a focus control. One difference on the Classic versus the SE is instead of having a brightness knob on the front of the machine, the Classic actually has software control brightness, which is kind of cool in that a screen saver can actually turn the brightness down as a way to save the screen. But you can also move a slider inside the control panel to turn the brightness up or down. I don't really know why they did away with the old knob on the front. There was really nothing wrong with that. But to that end, they actually added an extra control here, which is kind of like a, a sub brightness bias for that automatic brightness control. Now, if we look at the ports on this Classic, they are essentially identical to what's on the Macintosh SE, except it only has one Apple desktop bus port, but it does have floppy, SCSI, printer, modem, and Apple Talk, and audio. But you might be noticing that something is very wrong here. The motherboard is all completely out of whack and just sort of wedged in there. Now, almost certainly this thing had its hard drive taken out, and I guess when the back cover got put on, it was just slammed on there. And that happened, so that's not great. It also does have the screws on there. So I guess the person who took the hard drive out sort of slammed the cover on and then just forced the screws back on, even if the motherboard was all out of whack like that. It's pretty horrible actually when you think about it. Look, as soon as I took the bottom screws out, the a gap appeared here because it relieved the pressure on the poor motherboard. Oh dear. There's also loose pieces on the inside. Undoubtedly some plastic bits are broken from when the cover got forced on. Now, one thing about the Classic is to get the back cover off, it can be a little tricky because it often gets very stuck on the top side here. So even though the screws are out of the top, it is just not giving up. And you can kind of pull on it and make a little bit of headway. But you just have to kind of put this thing down and just kind of work it, shake it. Even that doesn't really come away because you see what's happening here. It's just hinging up. It looks like someone just actually used a screwdriver in there, which is not ideal. Now, one thing I sometimes try to do is you just sort of do this. It's a little violent, but you kind of hit it like that. And there we go, that, that released it. <laughs> I'm just gonna pull the neck board off like I, we did on the SE so we can take all this stuff out of here. And on the Macintosh Classic, it can have this optional RAM board here. So this expands it to two megabytes of RAM with the onboard memory. And then you can add two additional memory modules for a total of four megs, just like on the Macintosh Plus and SE. Let's see, here's the <laughs> motherboard. I don't think it's ruined or anything. It's just, um, yeah, it's just a little bit curved, a little bit bent. It has a battery that has not leaked. And just like I thought, definitely lots of evidence of leaking caps. So all these surface mount caps have leaked. It kind of has this wet look on the motherboard. You can kind of see around the caps that's just, yeah, you can see the leakage. Also, what's really weird is what is this? Does that come across in the camera? There's this little part here. Is this metal? Uh, it looks like metal. And that was actually stuck in between a couple of pins on the, on the motherboard. It wasn't soldered down. This is almost like a piece of solder or something. I don't know. Very weird. So I can tell right off the bat though, the motherboard is gonna need to have a recap, a full cleaning and inspection to make sure that we don't have any traces that have been eaten away by the leaking electrolyte from the caps. Besides this, I'm gonna say the computer inside is in pretty good shape. It's nice that the RAM board is here because we can get up to four megabytes of memory with that. I don't see a lot of problems in here. I don't think this computer was used a whole lot. Hard drive was removed and we don't have the hard drive bracket anymore. So that's kind of annoying. The hard drive slots in on top of the floppy drive, just like it did on the Macintosh SE with two screws to hold it in here. Luckily, if you're putting a blue SCSI in this thing, just use some double-sided tape or Velcro to hold the blue SCSI in right there. And it did have the SCSI cable that was left behind inside. So that's nice. Now, when it comes to leaky caps on this board, 
They're down in this area right here. And when it leaks, and if the machine is sitting on its feet, uh, like as normal, you actually start to see the electrolyte kind of a sticky brown substance all along the bottom edge here and around this area, all the way around to the speaker. Now, if the machine were stored on a, its side or in some other configuration, it you know, could leak in a different way. But I'm gonna say this one doesn't show any signs of leakage. One difference as well, I didn't really mention this, uh, the SE had a multi-voltage power supply. This one does not. It is currently set for 120 volts. I'm not sure if there's a jumper to move to switch to 240, but just keep that in mind if you're trying to buy one of these from the US to import into a country that's 240 volts, that could be a problem for you. This was a little piece of plastic that was floating around in there. Definitely something broke off the case when it was forced back together. Well, just for fun, I put the motherboard back in. I've reconnected the power supply. Let's power this thing up and see what happens. I think people wanna know what happens with a leaky cap Macintosh Classic. Will it power on or will it not? The reason why I wanna show this powered on is, hey, we're gonna be able to figure out if the power supply is working properly and the motherboard is working before we recap it. But also I wanna show that just because you have a picture of one of these working on say an eBay listing, doesn't mean that it doesn't need to have its caps done because this motherboard 100% does need that done. Power supply board, eh, that's a little bit debatable because it's not leaking right now. But unfortunately I see that the brown Nichicon caps on there are the ones that seem to leak on all the other ones. So it's probably gonna leak on these as well. Let's see what happens, here we go. Hey, well, yep, it works but there's no audio. <laughs> so I heard the disk drive seek. We obviously have picture, but there we go. It's actually working, but there was no chime. Now that's because those caps are part of the audio circuitry as well. And the fact that they are leaky means that they're basically open. And for the audio circuitry, it passes the audio through the capacitors. And when they're open, well, it's as if they're removed from the board. So you get no sound. The fact that geometry is bad, that's just an adjustment we can fix on there but it's working. So I'm gonna end this episode here and we know now that in the second episode, this machine at the minimum is gonna need a recap on the motherboard, but the fact is it's booting up. So that means it's good. None of the traces are eaten under those caps. So we should quickly be able to recap that. And maybe what I'll do in the second episode is we'll remove a couple of those leak prone Nichicons on this analog board here. And we'll see if they're leaking underneath. They just haven't like dumped their guts on the board. Might be a good test. And then because this is gonna be a pretty quick repair for this particular computer, I'm gonna to try to get to the Mac Classic 2 in that second episode as well. So I hope you enjoyed this episode, getting that Mac SE working and then poking around this classic a little bit. If you did, thumbs up. But if you didn't, you know what to do. Huge thanks to my patrons. Their names are scrolling beside the screen. They get early access to videos, other cool behind the scenes stuff. And yeah, subscribe, all the usual YouTube junk. And I guess that's gonna be that. So stay healthy, stay safe. I will see you next time. Bye-bye.